Welcome back to Pinpoint History, everyone. It's going to be a bit different for this next series we're going to embark upon. What I mean by that is the three episode mini series we've been doing together for the last six episodes is getting scrapped for this next series. I've had fun doing episodes in a trilogy style format, but three episodes just can't contain what I want to do currently. So I know you're probably bursting at the seams with anticipation for what we're going to cover. So let me soothe your ignorance and reveal our subject. The Rise of Macedon. We're going to chart the rise of the Macedonian Empire in the 4th century BCE. We'll mainly be focusing on the reigns of two kings, Philip II and his very famous son, Alexander the Great. The rise of Macedonia in this period to me has always held a special appeal. It's the culmination in a lot of ways to the classical era of the ancient Greeks. The rise of the great thinkers, your Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the great playwrights, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes, and so on. This period is ancient Greece at its zenith, and the conquest of Alexander the Great spread Hellenic culture across Asia Minor, Egypt, and even into the Hindu Kush which spread into parts of modern-day India with the formation of the Indo-Greek kingdoms. The conquests of Alexander are well known. The name still resounds throughout history, even 2,343 years later. Yet, how did Alexander do what he did? The bold conquest of the youthful Alexander, only 20 years old when he becomes king, and dies just a month shy of his 33rd birthday, conqueror of almost the entire known world. How was the kingdom of Macedon in 336 BCE the strongest power in the Hellenic world when Alexander took the throne? When in 359 BCE, 23 years earlier, the kingdom of Macedonia was a backwater in the Greek world pushed around by giants? That answer lies with Alexander's father, Philip. In my experience, the reign of Alexander's father, Philip II, is underlooked and forgotten due to the exploits of his more famous son. And yet, without the father, the son could not be what he was. Philip was the opposite of his son, ruthless, pragmatic, a reformer. He had clear goals for what he wanted to achieve. Alexander, by contrast, was headstrong, intemperate, bold. He was strategic, but lacked his father's cunning in certain aspects. But above all else, Alexander was a visionary. He wanted the impossible. He was never satisfied. Life was one great adventure to him. But enough of the waxing poetic on my end. Let's begin to break down this series on the Macedonians. We will track the star of Philip II from his birth to death, and then we will focus on Alexander afterwards. Obviously, parts of Alexander's life will be included in Philip's story, as he is Philip's son. We'll end the series on the aftermath of Alexander's death, talk briefly about the successor kingdoms that will come about afterwards. Eventually, I want to cover the words of the Diadochi in length, but we'll get to that in some point. The rest of today's episode will be a quick rundown of the history of the Kingdom of Macedonia, where it was located, and the origins of the ruling house of Macedon. The Kingdom of Macedonia was located on the fringes of northern Greece, in what we now call the Balkans. While the country that is now North Macedonia borders Albania to the west, Bulgaria to the east, and Kosovo and Serbia each to the north roughly. Ancient Macedonia bordered what the civilized Greeks called barbarians, with Epirus southwest to Macedonia, the Thessalian League directly south, and the Illyrians further northwest, with Thrace being roughly northeast. Macedonia did have access to the Aegean Sea, which allowed for trading access. I will attach a map of Macedonia at 359 BCE, which is when Philip II became king. Once again, you can follow me on Instagram at pinpoint underscore history so you can see the map. This location for Macedonia left it on the borders of the Hellenic world. For clarification, the word Hellenic refers to ancient Greece and is designated to refer to that period in time. With Macedonia on the fringes of the Hellenic world, many of the ancient Greek populations considered the people of Macedonia to not be included in the idea of an ancient Greek person. 
The ancient Greeks did share in an all-encompassing identity as Hellenes, but that was not the way they would think of themselves as. People would identify with their polis. Many poleises, which meant city-states, would be how many of the ancient Greeks would identify themselves as, which meant when it came to identity, it was city first, everything else was secondary. So while the Macedonians were not included in the catch-all identity of the ancient Greeks, the ruling family of the kingdom of Macedon was. The Macedonian royal line was known as the Argead dynasty. The origins of the Argead dynasty come to us from the father of history himself, Herodotus. Three brothers living in the city site of Argos had been exiled from the city. These three brothers were descended from a famous warrior named Temerus, who himself was descended from Heracles, who you know, his dad was actually the big guy himself, Zeus. I actually checked out my family history, and it turns out I'm also descended from Poseidon. According to Homer, Poseidon liked to visit Ethiopia in his off time, probably had a vacation home there. And that's when he met my 30 times great grandma. And now here I am, very divine. Or so my mother tells me. I digress, however. The three brothers were exiled from Argos. They were also descended from Hercules. The brothers moved on throughout the lands, searching for a new place to call home. Eventually, they found themselves on the Arestian Highlands, of where future Macedonia would be. They worked hard and found themselves a job as sheep herders, working very diligently at their craft. The new boss of theirs was one of the local chieftains, and apparently his wife would make bread for the boys and her husband. The bread made for the eldest three brothers, Perdiccas, would constantly raise to be twice the size of all the other loaves. This chieftain took this to be a sign that Perdiccas would be destined to be a great man, and had them banished because he was threatened. Obvious euphemisms aside, Perdiccas demanded that they be at least paid for their work. But the chieftain would not pay. And here we have some of the earliest recorded instances of migrant workers being exploited for their labor. Tale as old as time. In a classic case of your words accidentally having prophetic meanings, I guess the chieftain was gifted some of the high quality gas the Oracle of Delphi was hidden. Perdiccas was instead offered some sunlight that came through a stable, and Perdiccas accepted drawing a circle around the sunlight and leaving, looking for a new job. One of the priests in the chieftain's service hit the chief up and told him that this was a bad omen from the gods. The chief, realizing he was now the villain in someone else's origin story, set out some riders to kill the brothers, now fully embracing his role as the new antagonist. The riders found the brothers, but they managed to escape by jumping in a nearby river and being swept away by the current. I guess the riders left their trusty bows back at home. Eventually, the brothers got out of the river and began making their way once more, finding a new place to settle in for a while. The brothers eventually began taking surveys to see if anyone wanted to help them a conquering, and eventually, they did. The brothers conquered the land, and Perdiccas became the first ruler of the Kingdom of Macedonia. And the circle of sunlight he claimed became the royal symbol of the Argead dynasty. The name Argead is derived from its original roots in the city of Argos. The fledgling kingdom of Macedonia began expanding, and the first capital of Aegai was born. So the rulers of Macedonia were Greek, but why was the local population not viewed the same way? Some of the reasons I've read are a bit strange, but I'll lay them out for you. One. The Macedonians were ruled by kings, which to me is a little funny because Athens was a democracy, yes, but had been ruled by kings mythically and tyrants more recently for two generations with Pisistratus and his two sons Hippias and Hipparchos. Also, Sparta had a diarchy, which means they had two kings, and while their function as kings was to be the handlers of religion and lead the armies in war, there was a bit of, I guess, a constitutional backing to the monarchy with old senators or older members of society having say in the government. And then other various city-states had been under one-person rule. 
I guess the dynasty thing was hard for them to get over. An absolute power it's centered in one hand. Two, the majority of Macedonians lived rurally. This was at odds with the urban-based lifestyles further south in Greece. Three, the Macedonians drank their wine undiluted. The horror. Undiluted wine tended to get you pretty drunk pretty quick. And that was probably the reason why it was drunk undiluted. Four, they loved hunting and hunt all the time. They even hunted lions, apparently. The Greeks had native lions in this region, which was news to me, but explains the Nemean lion, I guess. Look at us, all learning together. Lions began going extinct in the Peloponnese in 1000 BCE, which is the most southern part of Greece, where Sparta resided. They were extinct in Macedonia around the 1st century CE, and sadly died out in Thessaly in the 4th century CE. Hit subscribe for more lion facts. Also, I forgot to mention that all the hunting would lead to feasting and partying, which brings us back to the undiluted wine. It's just a vicious circle for them. These reasons aside, Macedonia's position geographically kept them out of the day-to-day -day experience of their southern neighbors. Additionally, with Macedonia being bordered with the groups they considered barbarians, it becomes hard not to associate them with their neighbors. Many people lived and died where they were born, and the interconnectedness of the world we have today does not ring true for the people in the past. Still, the Macedonians were in limbo. Thucydides, our main source for the Peloponnesian Wars a generation earlier, wrote of the people in the fighting. He had the Greeks proper, barbarians, and notably the Macedonians. They were not quite barbarians, and they were not quite Greek either. The Macedonians practiced the religion similarly to their southern neighbors, and the gods and rites used would be practically the same. The kingdom of Macedon was quiet in its early years, and during the reign of Darius, the king of kings of the Persian Achaemenids, Macedonia became a vassal state to the Persians. The Persians had come into the region of Thrace and began subjugating the tribes that lived there. The king of Macedonia at the time, Minetus I, gave the standard earth and water to the Persians. The kingdom of Macedonia was small, and it did not have the capabilities to fight off the Persians. So instead of fighting them, he joined them. Amenitus' son, Alexander, and no, not the famous Alexander, Alexander the Great would be the third Alexander to bear that name. Alexander I was a shrewd ruler. In his youth, he had wanted to compete in the Olympic Games, but there were many protests to his joining as he was Macedonian. The judges of the Olympics eventually conferred and allowed him entry due to his ancestry. Once again, we see here that the Greeks saw themselves separate from the Macedonians, even when it involved the royal line of Macedonia. Alexander ruled for over 40 years and managed to diplomatically please his Persian overlords and maintain good relationships with the Greek city-states. The Persian War put Alexander's balancing act on precarious footing, but he managed to play both sides, so in the end, he came out on top. The Persians came through what was known as the Hellespont, a narrow strait that separated Europe from Asia, and at its narrowest length was only 338 feet wide. The Persians made a pontoon bridge and marched their troops over it, and then began marching through Thrace and coming south, passing through Macedonia. Alexander, as a vassal to the Persians mustered a group of cavalry to join the Persians. Here, we see Alexander playing it smart, as a contingent of Greeks were going to pull off the Persian path. Alexander escaped during the night and sent news to the Greeks that the Persians were going to come through a different route and hit them from the rear. Alexander convinced the Greeks to withdraw, and Alexander had managed to secure two victories, the first being the maintenance of his relationship with the Greeks, in the second, he secured a victory for the Persians as they were able to take control of the land without a fight. After the Persian defeat of Plataea in 479 BCE, the Persians marched home the way they had come and were attacked by the Macedonians. The Macedonians were able to throw off the Persian shackles and become independent. 
Alexander also used the Persian absence in Thrace to expand the borders of his kingdom threefold. Not bad indeed. The Macedonians would be involved in the affairs of the Greek world moving forward, allying themselves with both the Spartans and Athenians during the Titanic Peloponnesian War, which was funded by the Persians, who took a page from Alexander I's playbook and played both sides so that they came out on top. We'll end it here, and we'll pick up our next episode with the birth of Philip II, his childhood, and his rise to kingship. If you like what you heard, give the series a five-star rating wherever you're listening to it. Follow me on Instagram at pinpoint underscore history, and I'll be back soon. Let's get it.